This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policy making. This week, we're proud to present the 10th episode in our series on science, policy, and pandemics. This episode is brought to you in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. In this episode, our host, Dr. Rob Doubleday, and guest host, Selma Shaw, are joined by Professor Dame Sally Davies and Jeremy Hunt. Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the CSAP Science Policy Podcast. I'm Rob Doubleday, Director of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. In recent weeks, we've started a new podcast series talking about evidence and expertise informing public policy. We're bringing together perspectives from different disciplines and asking questions about what we know, what the uncertainties are, and exploring public trust. In today's episode, we're focusing on the principles and practices of decision-making in government. What role does evidence play when the stakes are high, decisions are urgent, and the science is not yet settled? At CSAP, we're always keen to try new things, and this podcast is no different, so I'm delighted uh, to introduce, for the first time, our guest co-host, former government advisor, Salma Shah, to help me delve with our guests into some of the big issues. Welcome, Salma. Thanks, Rob. It's a pleasure to be able to join you and share some insights from my five years experience in Whitehall and 15 in politics. I've seen firsthand the balancing act that goes on behind the scenes when ministers weigh up the scientific evidence against the realities of life, or as it's known, the politics. Today, we're delighted to be joined by two people who work closely together for six years and who have routinely found ways to balance the science, policy and politics. Dame Sally Davies, Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, a doctor, a clinical haematologist, who for nine years from 2010 was the country's chief medical officer, and Jeremy Hunt, MP, Chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee and Health Secretary from 2012 to 2018, amongst other illustrious cabinet posts. Welcome to you both. Now, given your backgrounds and your working relationship, we'd love to explore some of your real life examples when it comes to tackling massive public health challenges. We're going to look at three topics, Ebola, Novichok and childhood obesity, all health emergencies, but with extremely different complexions. If we can all cast our minds back to the spring of 2014, when there were early signs of a possible Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Jeremy, how does an issue like that arise on on the agenda of a a health secretary? When when did it first come to your notice? And and what kind of input did you rely on from from the scientific side of, of the department? Well, the first thing to say is that this is not part of the normal cut and thrust of politics. This is something that when it happens, it comes from left field. And as a politician with no medical or scientific background, you are totally exposed. And I was very, very lucky to have Dame Sally as my chief medical officer, because she was someone who I absolutely trusted. And part of the reason for that trust is because she didn't just understand the science, but she also understood the political pressures that I was under. And she understood my role in explaining to the public how we were going to need to respond. So, you know, without being over nice to Dame Sally, we're both uh, in different roles now. But actually, that trust between us was incredibly important because there were moments when I was going to have to take heat for telling the public things they didn't want to hear that she was advising me. And she was also going to have to take heat for defending the politicians in a, in a, in a sticky pass. That was the most important building block in this. Yes, I would agree, actually. And so you started on emergencies. But actually, if you think about it, we have to build a relationship. And it starts with respect. I was a student activist, of course. But I recognize that it's very difficult to be a politician. You're buffeted by what the public want, the need to get votes, the time it takes to socialize ideas and the manifesto and philosophy of your party, and yet you want to make a difference. And that's a very difficult job. So I recognize that. And then you build a trust. And when I was first appointed, I said, I offer no surprises. I will not go out and speak against government without giving you due notice and explaining what I'm worrying about. And there were occasions, of course, where we did have difficult conversations But we had them behind closed doors so that we managed to move things forward steadily. And frankly, if I couldn't explain what I needed to to Jeremy, then I wasn't going to explain it to the public either. 
So there was something about respect, trust, and, and that communication. And there were other times when I didn't explain it well. And Jeremy said, I think you're trying to say, and that's what you better say out there, because then they'll understand you. And he was right. Casting our mind back to the specific episode of the Ebola outbreak, presumably, Jeremy, uh, you know, in any one day, you have far too many sort of calls on your time and attention and people saying, no, this is the real number one priority you need to be focusing on. How do you make the judgment of when to really sort of put things aside and say, no, this this is something that's really going to need, need my attention? Well, Ebola was a, a public health emergency. In some ways, it wasn't dissimilar to coronavirus in that it started a very long way away, but we knew that if it wasn't controlled, it would end up arriving in, in the UK. And thankfully, we only had a, a very small handful of cases here. But it was a very good example of the partnership you need. I think one of the things that uh, Dame Sally is particularly good at is explaining things on the media in a way the public readily understand with a with an authority but also an empathy. That means that essentially people trust what she's saying. And in the case of Ebola, we had the health response in the UK, which was the most important thing on the public's mind. But actually, we also had the operational response in Sierra Leone, which was one of the three countries that the UK was responsible for. And we were basically given the delegated responsibility by the World Health Organization to, to deal with what was happening in Sierra Leone. So there was a huge operational challenge challenge um, involving nearly every part of government in the end to stopping the virus in Sierra Leone. It was a it was a very important uh, learning curve for me going through that. And Sally and I had many private discussions. Um, I'm going to give you one very good example of the kind of difficult decisions that you have to take. So do you stop direct flights between West Africa and the UK? Now, all the scientific advice is that there's absolutely no point in doing that because someone will just come to the UK via Paris or, or Berlin or, or somewhere else. But in terms of public confidence, it would seem very odd indeed to allow direct flights to continue. So I think there was an understanding of the need to weigh those two factors in. And sometimes the decision you come to, I think in this case, David Cameron did decide to ban direct flights. But I think that the scientists understood there was a, a political imperative to maintain some degree of confidence. So it's those kinds of things where you need to have that close relationship. I actually remember another bit of that, which was, of course, the border screening. And I remember sitting in Cobra and explaining to you and David Cameron, but it's not cost effective. And then you both saying, but actually this is about public and keeping them aware that we're doing everything possible. And once you'd, you've made me understand, it did take me a few minutes, um, and I said, and you know the bill, I was happy to support because you had a good reason for doing it. And I think that takes you actually into evidence is, is a social construct. And I absolutely recognize that. So there's randomized control trial evidence or there's experimental evidence. But a lot of this is much more about what are you trying to do? How are you trying to work within government on behalf of the public? And we have to think and balance all of that. And I think many scientists out there are purists about evidence as they see it, rather than understanding these debates that we're having day in, day out. And they sure are at the moment, too. So you obviously have built up a certain level of trust with Jeremy and other senior politicians which presume, as you say, is partly built on your empathy for the, the situation they're in. Um, and that's very important. But of course, then there's the wider scientific community that isn't sort of partly inside government. Did you find in the case of Ebola that you had difficulty sometimes explaining to scientists outside government how some of these decisions were being taken when in some sense they weren't entirely directly based on what the scientific evidence was saying? No, I didn't have a problem. I mean, first of all, Jeremy is great to work with because we could have those straightforward, honest discussions of where are you, where am I, how do we find the right, the best answer? Um, there's never a right answer, there are po a number of possibles. But actually, the scientific community know that I don't know how to lie. I only know how to tell the truth. And I am very value-driven. So they respect what I say and where I am, even if they don't like it. And the other thing is I always had a very open door 
phone and email. So I'd say, we're all trying to get this right. If you think I'm wrong, email me, phone me. If there's something I don't know, let me know. Meanwhile, we had a mass of different um, scientific advisory committees advising us, you know, advisory committee on dangerous pathogens, another one on infection prevention and control and PPE in the hospitals. There were lots of experts brought in to advise us. But my role in the end was to kind of assimilate that and put it out on a plate for Jeremy and say, this is where I think it all comes together for you to take a decision on. And if there were options, then uh, that's for the politicians to decide. And looking at the kind of scientific input that did go in to, to the Ebola crisis, it was perhaps notable that it was quite interdisciplinary um, at the highest level of, of kind of consideration. It was an absolute wake up for everyone that the biggest transmission was at funerals. And so you had to understand the funerals. And we were lucky. We had anthropologists on the South Coast who understood about those funerals, not only what was happening, but then had relationships with community elders and religious elders and were able to have that debate so that they could modify to respectful uh, funerals, but actually without the risk. Obviously, in a crisis like Ebola, there is systems that kick into gear. With the Salisbury poisoning with Novichok, I'm really keen to understand, given that there was a lot that had to be pieced together, it was more of an, of an investigation. How did that compare to the evidence that you were collecting um, in the Ebola case? How was that different? Well, I think one of the great things about our government system is that we have a system for COBRA and emergencies. So when I arrived, I had to be trained. I imagine ministers are also trained in how we come together, who leads, how you put the data together, who feeds in. So actually, Novichok was no different, except it involved a different set of players. It involved not only health and the public uh, health part, as in Ebola, but it involved uh, the police, the security experts, and everyone else. Uh, But the system is the same, and that is one of the strengths of our ways of working. So it wasn't a surprise, but of course, we had to build on all of those bits. And a lot of the meetings that normally would have happened in my office had to take place in uh, protected places, either in uh, Scotland Yard or in the Home Office or something. And I guess the same held for ministers too, did it, Jeremy? I started that crisis as health secretary and I ended it up as foreign secretary. So I started by looking at the health response. And, you know, fascinatingly, just as with Ebola, um, that old fashioned skill of contact tracing is incredibly important because you really are trying to identify every single person who might have been in contact with someone who who has a, a killer virus or disease. Um, and then um, when I became foreign secretary, I was then responsible for our international response. And, you know, I have to say that obviously it was completely riveting being able to see all the secret documents. There's very clearly who was responsible before we made that clear to the public. And um, this is perhaps not directly related to, to the science, Salma, but one of the most fascinating things was what do you do when another country has tried to assassinate one of your nationals in your country without starting a war. It's a very difficult thing to work out exactly what you do. And Theresa May took a very bold decision, which she's never really got much credit for, which is that she realized that the best thing we could do was publicize it and massively win the PR war. But we won the PR war simply by putting out into the public domain all the very clear evidence, the the photos, the footage painstakingly put together. That just made Russia look like total fools on the international stage for for parading these two men who uh, were fascinated by the height of the spire at Salisbury Cathedral. So that was a different angle for me. How difficult was it 
or easy perhaps to get to the international community because I, I remember that episode very clearly. And what was amazing about it was that the, there was a real international effort um, to recognise that Russia had behaved badly in this situation. You know, was it a case of you and the prime minister getting on the phone to your to your counterparts to to present this evidence? What did that involve that process? Well, it was actually my predecessor who is currently prime minister wow. who was responsible for uh, that response. And I have to say that the uh, Boris and the Prime Minister and the FCO did an extraordinary job in getting, I think, 29 countries, including NATO, to expel Russian diplomats. And it was a much, much bigger response than the Russians were expecting. And in the end, the only thing you can really do in a situation like this is say, has Russia paid a much higher price than they were expecting to pay? And have they paid a sufficiently high price to make them hesitate before doing it again? And I think the answer to both those questions was yes. So I inherited that response. Um, but I was around when the decision was taken to publish all the, the video footage that showed uh, what the two Russian agents had been getting up to. But I think it's interesting that in the wake of what's now happening with coronavirus, uh, that that whole incident did alert the public to how dangerous these pathogens can be and how uh, completely invisible they are and what a painstaking process it was. If you remember, great swathes of Salisbury were closed down, swathes mm. of parks were closed down while we tried to trace. And indeed, um, one of the victims very tragically was someone who had absolutely nothing to do with um, the scribbles. So uh, you can see the risks to ordinary members of the public as well. Just in relation to the substance itself, I heard from actually through a CSAP lecture, Rob, you'd be pleased to know, um, about how the stars had aligned around this substance of Novichok and the fact that, you know, down, down the road at Fulton Down, they had been studying this particular substance. So it was actually quite easy to trace. How much do you think actually we need to invest in that kind of research? And do you think we, we've done it enough? Actually, I, I suppose I put that to Sally first. They had been working on that family of their poisons to plants, and they knew that this one came from a particular Russian factory. Indeed, uh, Port and Down are part of our response. And I think they have been given extra funding because we've realized vulnerabilities. But they delivered what we needed. We were not underpowered in that sense. And I think that's a very interesting balance that it was an in-government science establishment that does that sort of careful work rather than an academic establishment in a university. So we need to call on science from different places and different sorts of science. I, I remember uh, sitting there in scientific advisory groups for emergencies, sages discussing decontamination of both the pizza place and the uh, bar, the pub that they went to, decontamination of clothes of people who had been to both of those places. Do you bin them or do you burn them at Porton Down or what do you do? And so balancing how, how it's done in perfection, but what is risk? And then that takes you into risk for Salisbury and debating those risks, um, public health risks, and then putting them out for the health secretary to think, OK, what risk are we going to take and what, and what do we say? We went for a very low risk, but we always worried that they might have dumped the original container of it, and sadly, we were right. It's important to have scientific advisors that have the trust of political decision makers and the trust of the wider scientific community. And we've heard how that can work well. I'm interested in when, when there are tensions, when there's sort of disagreements about the right way to go, how, how they are managed. And I'm, I'm wondering to, to sort of get at that, Sally, whether there were times when you were Devel developing the science base to inform decisions about childhood obesity, how you manage moments in that when, when there were tensions about what the right thing to do was? Well, I think it's quite clear that my role was to give advice and ministers don't always take it. And I, that was why I talked about respect and understanding the difficulty of their job. They may not take it because it doesn't fit with their 
view, so a libertarian view might be different from another view. They may not take it because actually they haven't got space in their agenda for it. You know, it is a very busy agenda, making sure the NHS is plodding on and thinking about threats and everything. The question then comes, I think, how do things become a priority and get addressed? And some of it's from a manifesto, some of it's from disease burden, some's from politics. I mean, Jeremy had me sit in with families suffering from various things because they had managed to get through to him on a personal level. And I then had to think about those diseases and what was being done and get information about testing and all sorts of things. So the agenda's full. How do you get something to come to the top? And clearly, we're talking about obesity. Throughout all my annual reports, obesity was a golden thread because you can see how it's gone up. You can see the impact of someone has said it's the new smoking. So how do you get the politician's attention? And I think it is through making the case and the disease burden and showing. But actually, Jeremy and I agree on this. Action needs taking. But then you've got to get the rest of the government to join in if it's not as solely health and effort to solve it. And I think we we um, have yet to get to where we need to for that. I mean, I would add on that one that, curiously, in, in very different ways, both Sally and I were outsiders as well as insiders. So when it came to, for example, rare diseases, I would be contacted. I remember being contacted by someone who had uh, Lyme disease, and I remember being contacted by someone who had uh, another disease that had similar symptoms to Lyme disease. And I could have just said, well, look, this is one of a million rare diseases, and you know, we do what we can. But I thought, actually, no, kind of a politician's job is to be listening to the public. And if there's someone who comes with a creed occur that just feels very worthy, then actually, I want the top people to hear them out. Out. When it came to issues of a lack of research, I would send them to Sally. If it came to sort of terrible treatment in the NHS, as I'm afraid sadly happened, I would send them to the top people in the NHS. And I think that was part of my job as an outsider and as an elected politician to be listening to the public and recognising that however well-meaning large bureaucracies are, sometimes they talk to themselves more than they do actually listen to the people that they're set up to serve. Sally's job as an outsider was to bang the drum on things like obesity and say things that ministers could never say as the country's chief medical officer and become an absolute bat noir in the Daily Mail and you know, be criticised as being the, the nanny in chief of the whole nanny state. And Sally bore those attacks with, with good grace and pretty nasty attacks, but she bore them with very good grace because she realised that part of her job was to change the public's mind. And I just give you a very interesting example of how Sally succeeded in doing that. You know, her biggest opponent for many years was the Daily Mail, and they were they were pretty brutal with Sally. Sally and I both wanted to introduce uh, the sugar tax, uh, the tax on sugary drinks, to reduce the amount of fizzy drinks with high sugar content that people were buying. And we finally had an opening with George Osborne, who agreed to bring it in. And around that time, I had lunch with the editor of the Daily Mail, who was then Paul Dacre. I was a bit nervous because I thought I would be in the firing line. I said, what do you think of all of this, Paul? And he said, difficult, he said, difficult, because my male readers are very worried about the amount of sugar in their diets. And the fact is that the Daily Mail didn't criticise us at all when we introduced the sugar tax. Um, but it took brave campaigning by Sally over many years to get people who are natural libertarians to understand that there was actually a role for the state in this. So I would say, just going back to that relationship between the politicians and the, the scientists, part of it is to understand that you both do have slightly different roles. And when you're exposed, you have to watch each other's backs a bit. But you also have to recognize that you are going to be saying slightly different things. And, and 
no harm if you are. How, how did you manage to keep the wider scientific community along with you? Because, I mean, I know based in the university, many scientists are acutely interested in what government does, decisions government makes, and are often quite frustrated when they see government make decisions that don't seem to them to accord with what the evidence suggests ought to happen. Perhaps with the case with obesity, but more widely, how, how do you manage to, as you said, you had an open door, but I mean, you know, there's a lot of scientists out there, you know, in practice, how does that work? I think people do chanter over the dinner table, as it were. But in practice, it's about communicating with the politicians, the public and the scientists and explaining how difficult it is. But on obesity, uh, we did run a series of research workshops where I brought in, under Chatham House Rule, a lot of the scientists from around the UK Number 10 came as well as uh, our own policy people, and we had really good debates. And those debates were seen to influence the different chapters of the obesity strategy. So we, I tried to reach out, and I think people knew that. They also knew that I was campaigning as hard as I could about antimicrobial resistance. And there's only so much time that you have. I do think that sometimes scientists are in their own little silo or their own little, you know, beehive focused on one thing without seeing the bigger picture. And I've had to learn that politicians have an even bigger picture and how do we kind of insert things and get things to move forward. And you can't always. So on obesity, I was asked to write an, an independent report before I stepped down as chief medical officer. We launched it actually just after I'd left because it wasn't a day to do it before. And I did not expect the government to pick it up and act at that point. But what I tried to do was write a foundational report, a bit like the Black Report, that people can always go back to. And I tried to reframe it in a way that this and future governments would be able to use. I think, you know, one of the jobs the Secretary of State has is to get number 10 over the line on important policy changes. And I have always believed that Secretaries of State have extraordinary power. I mean, you know, particularly now you're seeing all these stories in the newspapers about, you know, very dominant number 10 and cabinet ministers, uh, no power and powerful advisors and so on. But in practice, it doesn't work like that because, you know, only a maximum of, of 5%, perhaps 2% of a prime minister's brain is ever going to be focusing on health issues. You know, they've got to deal with relations with the president of America, the armed forces, whatever it is. Obviously, it's a lot more now, but in normal times. So the interesting thing about public health and Sally's role is that I was never going to really get much interest in number 10 about what my strategy was to deal with a winter crisis or to improve our waiting times in the NHS, that kind of detail. But public health measures cut through to the public a lot. What I noticed is that with all prime ministers, they're at least conservative prime ministers, uh, they arrive in number 10, essentially pretty libertarian and anti-nanny state. And maybe to get to number 10, they've had to campaign and get the support of right-wing tabloids that are in that space. Uh, Maybe it's just that they haven't really given much thought to public health issues. uh, And you can't blame them for that because they have to think about lots of different things. But then once they're in office and they see the evidence from the scientists, they, they change their tune. So we saw with David Cameron a, a pretty radical change. He, you know, he started off, I think, without enormous interest in public health issues. And then he actually for a while was in favor of minimum unit pricing on alcohol. We made enormous progress introducing plain paper packaging for cigarettes. And he was absolutely up for a massive obesity strategy. We did the sugar tax. And in fact, we were going to launch the obesity strategy that Sally and I both wanted on the very day that Theresa May won the leadership contest of the Conservative Party. And so it was it was cancelled. And then it was and Theresa May arrived exactly the same. David Cameron's obesity strategy was really torn up by Nick Timothy, which which broke my and Sally's heart. But you know, that was the number 10 decision. But then after she'd been in office a year. We started getting signals back saying, actually, she did want to do more on obesity. The amazing thing is, although I wasn't in the cabinet when Boris Johnson was prime minister, it seems that we're seeing exactly the same thing with Boris Johnson. He arrives as very much libertarian, anti-nanny state, now 
people are saying because he's had coronavirus, whatever the reason, he wants to make tackling obesity his number one priority. So I think a lot of what you have to do is to choose your moment. But actually, when it comes to my and Sally's period, you know, I actually think we did a lot on smoking, a lot on obesity, and a lot on a number of public health areas. But it's a question of being really opportunistic and dragging number 10 and number 11 over the line the moment you see a chink. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Sally. I do. And, and the sugar levy is an absolute example. There was a chink and you persuaded George Osborne and, hey, we got there. And I do think it's um, partly framing. I think the scientists produce the science and I've learned about framing. But actually the Secretary of State, Jeremy, very good at framing, which helps move number 10 to where it needs to be. So it is that partnership, science, framing, politics, that moves you to action. But to wrap up, Sally, can I ask you one final question, which is perspective, looking forward, and, and again, having scientists out there in, in our minds. What do you think you would say to, to the kind of the scientific world in terms of, of what people should be expecting in terms of how science should be informing policy and how can science be kind of better and more effective at contributing to, to policy and government decision making? I moved from wanting evidence-based policy to evidence-informed policy. You have to understand that we're there to give the evidence and the options, but it is not our policy. It is the politician's policy. And to be pr- pragmatic about that. And so if you want to engage with government, the best way is to start by volunteering or applying to be on one of our advisory committees and beginning to see how that works. But it is about being pragmatic and flexible. If you're dogmatic and you know the answers, people stop listening. How can politicians be better at taking scientific advice? Well, I think the central question that we're all going to have to deal with now is what research, what resource you invest in preventing crises that may only happen once every 100 years. We just had a pandemic that we haven't seen in the world really since Spanish flu 100 years ago. And we're going to take away from this the need to research much, much more into these kind of risks to try and stop them happening. And that is going to need a much closer collaboration between scientists and politicians than we've ever had. The climate is such the public now understands that the kind of risks that you, if you wanted to spend money in a big way, on researching some of the things that we've been going through now would have, I think, been very difficult five or 10 years ago. But the public understand that. But they need to know and trust the scientists in order for the politicians to win that argument. So I just think that the way to deal this is with openness and transparency and sharing with the public the the risks and also the uncertainties associated with those risks. But I think that collaboration between scientists and politicians has never been more important. Thank you so much. Join us next week when Salma and I will be talking to Alistair Darling, who, when he was Transport Secretary, was advised by Frank Kelly, a mathematician who was Chief Scientific Advisor in the Department for Transport. We'll be asking them questions about science, politics, and decision-making at the heart of government. CSAP Science and Policy Podcast is a production of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This episode of our series on science, policy, and pandemics has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Infectious Diseases and the Cambridge Immunology Network. This episode was hosted by Dr. Rob Doubleday and Selma Shaw and was produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Professor Dame Sally Davies and Jeremy Hunt. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ec.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ec.uk. Thanks for listening.